take you home Okay. Namaste, everyone. Namaste. Welcome. Namaste. So I'm going to give a little talk about space and awareness. I came across a Buddha Sutta that talks about space. I started meditating on space and I realized it has a lot of the attributes of consciousness mm -hmm. or more specifically awareness. And so let's see, I made some notes here of the similarities between space and awareness. First of all, space is empty. That seems obvious. I mean, practically the definition of space is that it's empty. But the point is that uh, it's invisible. There's nothing there. No resistance. No mass. Uh, and this is very important because everything else, even light, has mass. Even electromagnetic fields have mass. But space has no mass. In fact, space and mass are kind of opposites. And about the only thing that interacts with space is mass. It bends the space and causes gravity. But we're not really concerned with that now. Uh, I want to talk about space just as it is. So space then is frictionless. For example, if you have a light beam going out in space, it just goes forever. There's nothing to stop it, except if it has destructive interference with itself. And not only that, space is directionless. It's not like it's different in this direction or that direction. Space is all the same. It's consistent. And it's boundaryless. There's nothing that can separate one part of space from another part. Like the example is a cup. If you have the space within the cup and the space outside of the cup, you can't tell the difference between them. And once the cup is broken, they just merge back together. And actually, they were never separate. It was only in our concepts. So you have a boundaryless space. And because boundaryless, it's locationless. Unless you have a thing in space, it's impossible to make a location. And of course, Einstein famously popularized this in his theory of general relativity, that all location and velocity is relative to some framework or some object. So because of that, space has no edge and no center. It's uniform. It's the same everywhere. And uh, you can't find the end of it. So in the same way, you can't find the center of it either. It has no source. It doesn't depend on anything or rest on anything. It's not dependently originated, in other words. But it's independent. And because of that, it has no inside or outside, no up or down or this way or that way. Uh, it's just markless as the Buddha would say, without marks, without distinguishing criteria. And a very interesting uh, quality of space is that it doesn't cling to anything. This is similar to the attribute of frictionlessness. It doesn't cling, it doesn't become involved with anything, it doesn't become the effect of anything. 
nor does it affect anything else. It's supremely independent and uh, unaffected by whatever happens within it. You know, in space, we have like galaxies exploding and stuff like this, black holes and whatever. And space is just unconcerned with it all. Doesn't affect space at all. So because of this, their lack of interaction with anything, uh, space is indivisible, can't be divided into this space and that space. I mean, we can divide it conceptually, but in fact, it doesn't ever become divided. And because of that, it's timeless because we can't measure movement or location in pure space. There's no movement and hence no time because of course we measure time by means of movement, by motion. And then that means space is inherently motionless. You can't say that space moves. You can say that objects move in relation to one another, but you can't measure the motion of space or motion within space unless you have an object to measure it by. And finally, space is omnipresent. It's present everywhere. So space is inside, space is outside, space is here, it's there, it's everywhere. So now, when you think about this, this is the same as consciousness, or more properly, awareness. That awareness has all these same properties, plus the property of being aware. So this is really the foundation of everything. That awareness, this is Brahman, infinite, boundaryless, empty, Invisible, motionless, frictionless, directionless. See, all of these attributes that we find in space are also there in awareness. And again, the only thing that allows us to specify dimension or direction or movement or time is when we have objects in awareness. But then it's not awareness anymore. It's consciousness. So awareness is extremely subtle and absolute and foundational for everything else, even space. So Buddha in his jhanas or meditations, he says uh, there are two types of jhanas, the mundane jhanas and transcendental jhanas. So the first two transcendental jhanas are unlimited space and unlimited consciousness. In other words, space is by itself, by its nature, unlimited. And consciousness is similar. So similar, in fact, that you can have a space of consciousness. And within that space, all kinds of things can show up. But consciousness without an object is awareness or consciousness that has itself as an object. And awareness is singular, non-dual, and absolute, recursive, self-referential, and uh, has all these same attributes as space. It doesn't cling to anything. It's not affected by anything. It never changes. It never goes anywhere. It's indivisible and not, not an individual. Huh? Because to be an individual, that would mean consciousness is divided into this person and that person and so on. Mm -hmm. It's self-luminous, which is one attribute that space doesn't have that awareness illumines everything, beginning with its own self. 
And of course, it's mindful. Uh, so these are a couple of attributes that awareness has that consciousness lacks. Uh, but it's also motionless and it's also omnipresent. It's only when we move into duality that consciousness arises and consciousness does have a location and so on. So the difficulty with self-realization in general and uh, knowledge of the self in particular is that like space, there's no way to measure it or characterize it or manipulate it or interact with it. It simply is. It has no activities, no desires, no motion, and so on. So it's really, really subtle, the most subtle. But this is Brahman. And I think a very good way to reach intuitive understanding of Brahman is through the contemplation of space. And the Buddha calls this peaceful space meditation. Sounds like something new age, <laughs> but uh, he came up with it 2,500 years ago. So the Buddha is called Buddha for a very good reason. He was the first one to cognize emptiness or the lack of thingness and to realize that that is fundamental because without emptiness, there isn't a space to put the things into. <laughs> Where are the things going to be? Huh? So this is a wonderful meditation. I've been playing around with it last couple of days. And it really, it leaves one feeling very clean and refreshed that uh, non-clinging, especially, and non-interaction uh, are attributes of consciousness and space. So the more our consciousness is like space, the closer it approaches to awareness or Brahma, and the more unconditional and absolute it will be. So I think this is a wonderful exercise and it's something uh, that harmonizes very nicely with what Ramana is teaching in the uh, Vivarta series that we're going through now. And uh, Atma, uh, sorry, Vachana, huh? the uh, Atma Vachana, meaning self-inquiry, should reach these same conclusions and these same states. So it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking of awareness or the self or Brahman as a thing. This is because of the positivist Vedic language, but the Buddha's concept of space is there to help us see it in a negative way as the lack of these concrete uh, properties. And this comes closer to the real nature of awareness or Brahma or Nibbana, Nirvana, uh, than any positivist uh, description can. So I just wanted to talk this up and kind of put it out there. And um, I'm doing a video or I did a video already on the sutra where this instruction is found and that'll be published in the morning tomorrow. So, okay. Are there any questions or discussion? Well, yeah. I, go ahead, Evelyn. Go ahead. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah. <laughs> See what happens. I just listening to you, uh, I through a sense of spaciousness, 
is seems to be what's what, what is happening. And uh, I, it's hard to say anything. <laughs> so I'll let Richard go ahead. <laughs> I think we may have lost Richard. No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I was, there you are. I was just uh, going to say uh, for uh, 30 years, I've been hearing uh, about space-like is this consciousness yeah. and awareness. One of my favorite Nomi songs is space-like. And uh, you did a great job of uh, saying that. I know one of the things I've uh, tried to do in my own meditation is to find an edge of consciousness. And, you know, that's one of the things I can't find anywhere. I don't know what it is about it, but, uh, you know, there are no edges. I can't find a corner or a wall or anything. And I like it. Yeah. Now, when I was young uh, and reading science fiction, one of the things I would do is uh, imagine looking at myself from another planet on another star and I like that view because it let me see how insignificant everything I thought about was. Mm -hmm. That's not really space-like. That's just a sense of deep perspective. But it was helpful at the time. Yeah. 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 So... Well, consciousness... Um, oh, go ahead. I was going to... For me, um, that awareness, is all, it's just always been there. Um, and, and I know that when I sink into it, yeah, there's, there's no boundaries to that. Um, and sometimes I think that uh, there's the ego or the mind says, whoa, let's not get too, let's not go too far. <laughs> uh, because in a, in, a, in, a, in a way, it's like the, that'll be the end, the end of me. And that happened quite a bit in my in meditations um, some years ago that, uh, it, it was a feeling of limitless space. Uh, and, but like there was this tether. And that, so now I think with, you know, the support that I'm finally getting, I told Richard, I've never had anybody to talk to about this ever. You know? Uh, there is a sense of, I don't know what to call it, that I can really allow myself to step off the edge. Uh, and and what, what seems to be happening now, you know, this inquiry, it's like uh, before it was an 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 effort, but since some part of me has said yes, this inquiry seems to be doing itself. Uh, yeah, and in in places where I would really have to focus not to get distracted, or I would start to get involved. Since Richard has pounded into my head <laughs> that there is no other self, and I've let that in, and and so that inquiry just seems to come at times, and I go, oh, 
And uh, what you say about spaciousness is it's so beautiful. Um, there isn't any object. You know, if, if I am that spaciousness, then any object that comes in there cannot, cannot belong. <laughs> so that's any, any feedback that you have for me is so gratefully it's received. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful because it's unlimited and spacious. Because in our ordinary life in the 3D world, we're constantly running into limitations. Yeah. And various barriers and separations and, you know, discriminations and all kinds of things that separate us. And deep down, fundamentally, we don't want to be separate. Yeah. Yeah, it's a that feeling of separation is really the root cause of suffering. We want to be one with everything. Huh? You know, like you heard the joke about Buddha walks into a, a, a milkshake place and says, make me one with everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we we want to include. We want to be inclusive. Yeah. We want to have all these tastes within us. We don't want to have to keep them outside. Yeah. Or separate. Or we don't want to be cut off from or alienated from anything. I mean, deep down inside. Now, the mind is another story. The mind, that's how it, it justifies its existence by saying, well, you're an individual and you have to take care of number one. And, you know, you're different from everybody and all this kind of stuff, which is based on duality. And certainly uh, the world reinforces this view our education, our society, even our language. Yes. So <laughs> it's really kind of amazing that anybody has come across this uh, non-dual consciousness at all. Mm -hmm. And it makes it a very precious resource when we run into people like Ramana Maharshi, Nomi, and other teachers who have this view and can articulate it or communicate it yeah. in such a way that we can share it. And I'm not gonna go, you know, I'm not gonna become a fanatic and say that we all should just sit down under a tree and be silent and merge with the universe. You know? <laughs> no, because these, different views are going simultaneously. If we look at our actual experience, mm -hmm. there's a part of us that cares about being an individual and that wants to take care of the body and all of the various functions and We've relationships. Lost communication somebody trying to say oh no that was dog oh <laughs> dog is trying to get it get in on this sounded like that was <laughs> yeah so um, so these are both going simultaneously the uh, natural urge toward oneness and at the same time, the individual identity and all that. So it's not that we deny any of it. We have an inclusive view. And that's what, you know, the four bodhas, the four views and the four yogas 
and the four states of consciousness are all about. You're all going on simultaneously. We don't deny any of them, especially the highest one, Turiya, because that's the root of all the others. And when I first started to uh, listen to Swamiji, one of the things that I understood immediately was the power of the four views, the power of the four yogas. You know, I know me just presents the highest all the time. So uh, listening to know me, uh, I didn't get these other views expressed in any kind of concrete way when I was trying to teach to others what Nomi showed me I found some people could hear it and some people couldn't and understanding what I do now about the four views I understand what I was encountering with these other people and so uh, now when I can't get them when they don't have this natural rapport like you and I have, Evelyn, then uh, I start talking about uh, you should find some way for selfless service, which is yeah, yeah, the, be yeah. the beginning of the four paths. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, this expression of the four paths is really valuable. And it's valuable yeah. uh, because we all need to uh, find ways that we can continue to make steps towards the highest. And if you can't, if you are not ready yet to inquire, then you need to find ways that you can uh, invest in your own growth. And these are ways. Yeah. Yes, I, I so agree with what you're saying. There's two thoughts going on in my head right now. One is, I just want to say, listening to Nomi, and when he used the term misidentification, I had not heard that before. I had some other little, I don't know, shift from that. But misidentification what that gave me was like, okay, just as um, Ajay Shakti was saying, life goes on. You know, I don't have to obliterate the things of life. It's the misidentification that's the problem. And I never got that. Yes. But I'm getting it now. <laughs> yes. Yes, when I first heard Nomi talk about misidentification, I felt yeah. like I finally understood what I had been yeah. reading all those years about Buddhism and attachments, because these misidentifications yeah. <laughs> are the key to all of those attachments. Yes, yes, and just isn't that um? You just need to hear a different arrangement of of work, sounds and clink. You know, something clicks. And now before the old brain uh, forgets, um, talking about the uh, the uh, the other jhana, jhanas, um, I have long been a, a, an advocate of people starting where they're where they're at. Um, and uh, when I wrote that comment about forgiveness, I don't see how anyone can get into an elevated state if they haven't done the work of forgiveness, because otherwise they're dragging all this stuff with them. Um, so that's part of that karma yoga, it seems to me. And also what I admired about the, the Buddhist teachings was the fact that he so stressed sila, ethical moral behavior. And some people want to launch, just pass that on by and proceed on to, you know, the next greatest thing.
thing. Um, and I, and I, I don't see that as working, you know, I'll just, you know what I'm saying? It matters in karma yoga. It matters. Uh, you know, it matters because karma can block us from these higher yes. states. Yes. If we are carrying a big load of karma, I mean, it's even in the Bible, forgive mm -hmm. all who trespass against you, you know, before you go in the temple. That's right. To pray. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. you know, then, uh, or if you owe anybody anything, you want to take care of that before you go to pray. See, he was saying, in other words, balance your karmic accounts, make everything, bring everything up to date, Yes. And then with a free mind and heart, approach God. You know, and that is such good advice. And that's definitely putting karma yoga first and then bhakti. Yes. And yeah. then Raja yoga. And we can thank Shankara for that. Shankaracharya, as far as I know, was the first one to bring that out. But his commentaries are so dense and impenetrable that very few people read them and those who read them don't understand them very well. Mm -hmm. So um, Ramana was the one who surfaced it in the Guru Vachika Kovai when he says that he deliberately set aside the other doctrines and he's preaching Vivartavada. So when you look into what are these other doctrines and who are they for? That's where the whole Chaturvada structure comes from, you know? And it's just a conceptual structure, okay? It's not meant to be a dogma or a doctrine. It doesn't have sharp boundaries. They're all kind of fuzzy, you know? Uh, <laughs> but it is a set of conceptual uh, views that really help us to understand the stages of the path. And it makes a lot of things clear that aren't clear without it. Yeah. Yes. I have to smile because the car, talk about debts owed. I must have owed a lot of debts to <laughs> a lot of people because my life has been really about repayment. And I think, God, I don't even want to know what I was before because, <laughs> but, but when those deaths were, and at first I did it kicking and screaming. And then this last one, which was really, you know, heavy. I remembered that I knew what was going on at that point. And I remembered some, I forget who said it, but the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So I did. Mm -hmm. And then it ended. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. You learned ended. the lesson. I did. And I had no rancor about it because I understood it, you know. And that's when I really, uh, something came loose. I, I don't know how to describe it, but my practice deepened from then on. Well, it will because you have... Uh, made your counts normalized. Yes, I, I believe I have finally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because it's true, you, you can't, if you feel that you owe anyone or that anyone owes you, how can you approach God because of the, this unresolved tension? Exactly so. So to go into deep meditation, you have to have a clean slate. Yes. And this is yeah. so important. I even, when I'm about to meditate or do any big work, I'll clean my room. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I literally physically clean my room and clear the decks for action, you know. <laughs> and the same goes for emotionally. That if there's any current issues, yeah, I try to resolve them. And, and first of all, resolve them internally. And then yeah. if anything needs to be done externally, I do that too. Yeah. 
Yes. That just makes everything so much easier. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. No, I just wanted to comment uh, about Shankara. While I have not read nearly as much as uh, Swamiji has, I've still taken time to read some of the things. And my first encounter with uh, Shankara was on his crest jewel of discrimination. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, it took me a year to read it. And I was reading it with a notebook, taking notes like I was in college, because uh, it wasn't simple to uh, understand what he was saying. The other thing I would say is that was a year very well spent. Yeah, yeah his, his uh, books especially are like foundational knowledge. The yeah. knowledge that makes everything else make sense. But boy, is he dense. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> now, the interesting thing about Shankara, and which uh, is once you know the Chatur Darshanam, it makes sense. Although he pretty much invented the term Kevala Dweta, pure non duality. He also established many temples or renovated temples and created the high standards of worship for those temples. You know, famous temples like Tirupati and, uh, you know, so many others all over India, both uh, Vaishnava temples and Shiva temples, goddess temples also. And he wrote devotional works that are just, you know, without any parallel. So he wasn't just exclusively focused on jnana. This is the point. Yeah. He wasn't on sectarian. He, he uh, looked at all different levels of the path and facilitated them for the people that need them, which I think is such a high-minded point of view. You know, such a broad-minded uh, view and action. And so even though the more modern uh, Shankaras have uh, pretty much abandoned that, except for Kashi, you know, um, still at the root, the, the Shankaracharya Sampradaya is like, in a way, like the basis of modern Vedic religion all over India. Uh, it's just that it takes a lot of scholarship and a lot of deep study to get into it. So I can totally understand why Ramana and Nomi want to concentrate on the Vivartavada, why they only want to talk about Kevala Dvaita, because there's a need for that. But on the other hand, there is also a need to show its connections with the other stages of the path and how you can develop organically, you know, because most people don't start out on a dueta, or if they do, they take it in a wrong way. Yeah. Yes. And I like I... that. In... Go ahead, oh, please. I could talk, talk on Go ahead, please. Night. I'm just making noise. <laughs> You know, like uh, Uladu Narpadu starts with, because we see the world. Because we see the world, that means there must be a creator. And if there's a creator, we need to have a relationship with the creator. So we have to find out who that creator is. And the search for the creator of the universe begins with the concept of God, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient being, but it evolves through gradual stages and entirely predictable stages 
to Atma Vicharna, to looking into the self. So, um, you know, definitely Ramana was aware of this. And for sure, uh, it was a conscious choice on his part because he had enough people who were qualified that he could specialize, knowing that they would get the background in other places, just from the culture. Whereas today, that's not true, especially outside of India. And so what are, what's happening is that people are jumping up to the Advaita platform and then crashing, falling down uh, because they don't have the background or they don't have the prerequisites. Then that's another reason why I decided to put major energy into talking about, for example, the goddess path and bhakti and karma yoga. But now I'm starting to feel little urgency, you know, that there might not be much time left. So I really want to focus on Ramana's teaching and the ultimate truth. But the other series are there. So people can go back and look at those. Uh, for example, you mentioned Sheila. And in the very beginning, we did a couple of series called uh, Being in the World, which was based on existentialism and uh, being integrity, integrity yeah. which is based on the idea of, of ethics and call of the friend, which is the idea that the, the realized being is uh, before anything else, our friend who is calling us to get in, ta in touch with our inner truth. In other words, he's not acting independently, but he's reflecting the truth which is already there within us that we're unaware of because we're all caught up in the world. So there has to be a stage where one gets assistance from a guru, from scriptures, from temples, uh, from some kind of a sangha, a holy association, to overcome this uh, entanglement in the world and then start to look inside and find that inner truth, the self within. And you and I, Evelyn, know what it's like not having uh, that support because you're left fundamentally with your ego as your teacher and the ego doesn't work very well as this kind of teacher. It's on mutual admiration society. <laughs> <laughs> I, the great me. <laughs> Why, yes, I agree with you, great me. <laughs> you couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Yes, that's why this is such a gift. And I prayed for this, you know, please, God, send me somebody. Because, you know, I did my book group out of, that was sort of a seva of mine. And I just realized, I, I shared with Richard that at the end, clearly I could see where they wanted to go. And I didn't want to go there. So someone else took the the group over and I I haven't looked back um, and you, it, but it's a clear example how people even if something is put in front of them to say look can, have a look at this they're 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 not interested they're not interested and it's a hard nut to crack that and I wasn't going to be the one to do that you know so I I what I've done instead you know, I got the that little book, uh, <clears throat> the four requisites for self inquiry that yes. Naomi. It's a little booklet. Yes. And I got, and so I had this open invitation. I said, you know, I'm not going to do the group anymore, but if anybody is interested, I'm happy to have them come and we can share about this. Well, no, no one has come so far. <laughs> but so the invitation is there. 
you didn't have yes. anybody who wanted to come and learn about discrimination and detachment. Not so far. <laughs> That's Not right. So far. The one, I was going to say there was a time uh, when I first started to go with Nomi, then the satsang hall was full and hard to find seating in it. And uh, after a couple of years, uh, about two thirds of the people Nomi had asked to find another home, which to me seemed extraordinary. Who hears of any spiritual teacher telling people to go away? And yes. these were basically people who were not qualified. Right. And so, no, you know, what he wanted to do was to speak to the people who were able to hear him deeply. And he didn't care yeah. if that was only one person. That's fine. As long as it, yes, they could yes. hear what he had to say. Yes. Quality beats quantity. Yes, it does. Yes, for sure. And, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of time to, to waste in, in terms of years. You know, I'm 76 now. And uh, yes, I don't, I don't have time for anything really but this. I think we uh, may share that feeling with you, Evelyn. Definitely. <laughs> yes. No more greasy kid stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. In my, I still have one little thing my, my, my neighbor can't stand. I, I live in a little complex of three houses and they're real close together. <laughs> and I told him, I said, you know, I'm going on retreat. I'm just doing my own retreat. And I explained to him several times, knock, knock. Do you have this? Here it is. Knock, knock. Got any olive oil? <laughs> and, and I'm working, you know, I'm working with that. And, and as you said before, you know, a, a clear the inner and whatever is going on with uh, within me, and then I don't feel it's inappropriate. You know, if I have to be s strong with words, I will because I don't want. If I'm in a state of deep meditation, it's not it's not okay for knock knock. Do you have any olive oil? <laughs> you have to draw your boundaries. Yes. Make them clear. Yes, yeah. yeah. Yes, I thought I because had. There's, well, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny, like when I came here in Sri Lanka, because I'm on a special diet, I can't take rice. Well, now everybody in Sri Lanka eats, you know, mostly rice. Yeah. So I had to tell my cook, I don't know, five times. And finally, like, sit down with her and her son and spell it out. You know, I cannot eat rice. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Before it actually sunk in. Yeah. Oh, that's a predicament. <laughs> well, it's the same with your neighbor. Yeah. You probably never encountered anybody who was doing something that demanded such unbroken concentration that you don't want to be disturbed, period, full stop. You know, I mean, in today's society, that's very rare. So, I mean, maybe you need a sign on the door or, yeah. you know, something really explicit to draw that boundary, yeah. to, to draw that line. Otherwise, you wind up compromising your self-integrity. Yeah. I'm not doing compromising this. That's out of the question. Yeah. There is a stage in meditation where you just can't be interrupted. Yes. And if you do get interrupted, man, it takes like hours to get back in the groove. Yeah. And, if, and you, I can feel it in my entire body, like somebody hit a tuning fork. You know, it's like, whoa, because it's too big of a jolt. 
Yeah. Yeah, you got to take care of that. Yeah, I will. How lucky I am! What a how blessed I am! And I have two. Well, we're we're happy to have you here. Oh. <laughs> oh, I have my my beautiful picture. Of Romney just looks at me and said, "Trent, here we would say tranquilo. <laughs> Don't worry. Tranquilo. Yeah. Yes. Don't worry." Muy tranquilo. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I hate to be a uh, this way, but things are winding down, and I think maybe it is time to uh, tell each other namaste and then go on with whatever is next. We know it's nothing. But anyway, thank yeah. you, uh, Evelyn, and thank you, Swamiji, for this time today. Yeah. Thank you, Richard, for taking care. Thank you so much. Namaste. 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 All Tatsat. You know, Om Tatsat means it's uttered at the conclusion of a Vedic sacrifice. Oh. That, that tut means that, or Brahman, and sat means truth or eternity. Ah. Uh. So, om tat sat. Okay, om truth eternity. Yeah.